So to quickly introduce ourselves, um, my name is Kate Chapman and my colleague here, um, who will also be talking today is Dr. Jody Green. And we are extension educators with the University of Nebraska and we're also urban entomologists. So a lot of our programs really emphasize indoor pests, like this couple that I just mentioned, particularly structural pests, pests of health significance. So bed bugs, termites, cockroaches, things that infest pantries, things that can sting us, ticks. Um, once again, all the really not fun things to have around, but we also um, do quite a bit of programming with outdoor pests and beneficials too, especially this time of year. I think that takes up a huge load of the questions that we get asked them, um, things that people find in their garden or how to plant a pollinator garden and things like that. But our job, um, we primarily consult with community members. We talk a lot with homeowners, pest management professional, professionals and businesses, city entities, schools, um, a lot of things like that. So we love talking to you guys. So once again, if you have questions, please feel free and ask because we wanna learn from you as well. Okay, so we're going to start this webinar off with a quick poll. I'm gonna launch it here. And this poll is going to have two questions. Um, the first question is, what type of housing do you live in? Because this webinar is mostly um, for homeowners and renters. So we wanna, and how you approach bed bugs to kind of depends on what type of housing you're in. And then the second question is, have you ever encountered a bed bug? So I'm gonna launch the poll now. And I want you to just take a quick second and answer those questions. Interesting. I'm seeing the answers as they come in. Okay, so I'm gonna give it two more seconds. All right, so I'll share the results with everyone. Can you guys see that? Yes, no. Okay, I'm seeing some head nods. Okay, perfect. So it seems like the vast majority of you live in single family housing. At least one of you lives in multifamily housing. So that would be um, like a duplex or an apartment unit or something similar. Um, and then I'm quite surprised of how many of you have encountered bed bugs. So over 50% of you have encountered bed bugs. And then if you haven't encountered a bed bug personally, you know someone who has, and um, that is actually pretty par for the course. Um, bed bugs are very common and we'll kind of get into those a little bit more. So thank you for answering that really quick. Let's see. So um, as you've probably guessed by now, this whole webinar is about the human bed bug. And so the species name for human bed bug is Thymex lectularius. And this is what an adult bed bug looks like and then a baby bed bug looks like. And so today we're going to go over um, one, why bed bugs are important, what makes them successful, how to identify it yourself or how you can utilize other resources to get it identified. We're going to go into prevention tips. So how you can um, like travel, things you can do when you travel that to prevent bringing bed bugs home. And then we're also going to go into the management side of things because when we asked um, upon registration, kind of the topic areas that you were interested in, people are interested. And of course, you have a bed bug, what do you do about it? Um, and we'll go, Jody will talk a lot about um, um, the professional treatment methods. So if you hire a professional, what they, what they typically do, and as well as some, um, not necessarily DIY, but um, if you opted to treat it yourself, um, the recommendations for that as well. And so this is where the poll gets really interesting. So one out of five Americans, so this is a survey from 2011, has had a bed bug infestation in their home or knows someone who has encountered bed bugs at a home or in a hotel. And so when we think about just how many people live in the United States, that is a really large number. And bed bugs um, can really 
affect anyone. So it doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter how clean your house is, doesn't matter how big your house is, everyone is at risk of bed bugs. And so what makes them so successful? Why have so many people encountered them? Well, the first thing is, is that bed bugs are really small. So when we think about the size of a bed bug, you can look at this left picture and see that the egg of a bed bug is smaller than a poppy seed. So because they're so small, a lot of the times they'll also go unnoticed unless you're actually looking for them. And so they grow and about the adults will reach around the size of an apple seed. Um, and you can kind of just see here the scale. And so unless you're an entomologist or someone that's trained to look for these little tiny things that are crawling in the corner of your eye, you might just not notice them. And that's why they're so successful is because their size is small and they go unnoticed. They also reproduce really quickly as with many insects do. Um, so this is the uh, life cycle of a bed bug. They have incomplete metamorphosis, which means that they have three life stages. So they have an egg stage, they have a nymph stage. And so a nymph is just an immature bed bug. And then they have an adult stage. And so this is a little different than like a butterfly's complete metamorphosis where they have a cocoon or a chrysalis. They don't have that stage, they just have the egg nymphs and adults. And to develop through this life cycle to become adults, and even the females, even to lay eggs, they need to take blood meals in order to continue growth um, into this life cycle. And the rate of how fast they go through this life cycle really depends on environmental conditions and how much food or blood meals are available to them. So typically to get from an egg to an adult in good condition, it takes about five to six weeks to complete that life cycle. Um, and from egg hatching to the end of its life, a bed bug in optimal conditions will live around six to 12 months. So they reproduce fast and they have a long life lifespan and they can have three to four generations per year. So as I mentioned, the female requires blood in order to lay eggs. And after she's mated with the male, she can lay eggs up to 50 days after that mating, and she will lay a single female bed bug, will lay about 200 to 500 eggs in her lifetime. So that kind of just lets you think, okay, if you have five female bed bugs that have all mated, they're all laying hundreds of eggs, that lifespan is going to, it's gonna have those three to four generations a year. It's gonna get out of hand really quickly. What also makes them successful? Well, they are excellent at hide and seek. Um, so not only are they small, but they know where to hide as well. So here are some examples of where you'll typically find bed bugs hiding. So a lot of the times on beds or in linens, you'll find them hiding in the seams. This middle picture is from the bottom of an ottoman, and you can see that my finger is actually pulling back that seam. So had I not done that, we wouldn't have been able to see that bed bug at all. And can you spot the bed bug in the last picture? It's a little tiny bed bug that is inside this plastic. So they're really good at hiding. They can get through the smallest little holes in things. And if you hadn't noticed the eggs in that first picture, their eggs are often um, laid in these hidden locations as well. So when we think about where to look for bed bugs, we need to look in really tight spaces. Those are going to be the seams of mattresses and furniture. It can be, um, in the hidden areas of a nightstand. It can be behind a picture or a poster on a wall. It can even be behind outlet covers as well. And then the last thing that I have listed that makes them successful is that they are professional hitchhikers. And this is why they're so successful at spreading pretty much everywhere. So this is how they primarily spread is they hitchhike on things. Um, if you store things, in or on top of or near a bed or a sitting area, there that item is at risk for picking up a hitchhiker. So this photo is from Jody. This was um, someone who stored their backpack, I think on a hook right next to the bed and the backpack itself became infested with bed bugs. And now everywhere that person visited and set their backpack down, that place was then at risk of getting a bed bug introduction or infestation as well. And so these things are really important to note for travel. Um, and Jody will talk about this a little bit later on. So when you go to a hotel, 
think about where you're putting your suitcase. But because before I became an entomologist, I probably would have thrown my suitcase right on top of the bed and unpacked it. And so maybe rethink about putting it on the bed and think about placing it somewhere else. <clears throat> and bed bugs are really important because obviously they bite us. They require a blood meal and humans are their primary host. And bites um, look different for people. So they bite us and they locate us by sensing carbon dioxide and heat. And they feed about every three to five days. Um, some people may have allergic reactions to bites as you can kind of see on this poor baby here. Um, Jody herself, um, she gets these huge swollen welts when she gets bit by a bed bug because she has really bad allergic reactions. But over 30% of the population have no reaction. So um, we field a lot of questions of, um, I, I, I just, I got bit, um, is it a bed bug, you know? And I'll address that a little later on too, but um, it goes far beyond bites because some people have reactions to everything and some people will have no reaction to bed bugs as well. And so because they bite us, I think a big question is, an insect is biting me. There are insects out there like mosquitoes or other invertebrates like ticks that when they bite, they can give me a disease. And so the big question is, they bite us, they take blood meals, do bed bugs transmit disease? And it's kind of a complicated answer. So can bed bugs carry disease? Yes. Um, research has shown that bed bugs in their body can carry um, uh, what we know of 45 disease causing pathogens. This could be bacteria, fungi, parasites, viruses. But the cycle of disease transmission not only requires acquisition and maintenance in the body of the pathogen, and we know the bed bug can hold that pathogen in its body, but research has also shown us, even though the bed bug can have a pathogen inside of it, it is not successful at transmitting that pathogen to people. So even though they can carry it so far, there has been no evidence that major infectious disease outbreaks have been associated with bed bugs. So if someone asks, no, bed bugs do not transmit disease. So in addition to all of these horrible things, biting us, taking blood meals, there's these other negative impacts associated with bed bugs. There's a psychological aspect. There could be delusions, anxiety, depression, stress, stress, obsession, loss of sleep. Um, I've dealt with clients that have post-traumatic stress disorder because they've dealt with bed bugs. It's a very real thing. Um, there's a social aspect of it. So there's this negative stigma associated with having bed bugs, and it's a very unfortunate thing. Um, I will say that I've had a family member that has recently had bed bugs within the last couple of weeks, and she was not allowed in the lobby of her apartment building until they were eradicated. So there's that social like distance, um, negative perception, social isolation, strained relationship aspect to having bed bugs as well. And lastly, there's an economic um, aspect of it or an impact of it too. So some people will choose to discard their furniture if they have bed bugs. Um, eradication efforts, if, you, if using professionals, is not inexpensive. It costs quite a bit of money um, to thoroughly eradicate bed bugs. And then some people might also miss employment or school to help deal with the problem as well. <clears throat> so where do bed bugs come from? Um, as I mentioned, a lot of bed bugs will come from traveling. So if you stay at a hotel or another place, um, and you know they could possibly get on a suitcase, a purse, or a bag and they hitchhike, they're really good hitchhikers. But we also see bed bugs come into homes um, from, from purchasing or um, picking up of secondhand furniture or secondhand items. So sometimes even if you go to a reputable store that's selling an item secondhand, maybe it wasn't thoroughly inspected for bed bugs and now you're bringing that dresser into your home and you're introducing bed bugs that way as well. But it's not only those two. Um, Bed bugs, um, libraries, if you've ever, not to like freak you out about libraries, but libraries have their own bed bug prevention program where they actually screen all the books that are returned for bed bugs. And they have this action plan that they do if they find a book does have a bed bug. Um, this bottom left picture is the lost and found of a school. So we showed you that backpack picture earlier. The middle picture is of a doctor's office. So, um, People spend a lot of time waiting in doctor's offices, so there could be introductions there. 
and you have airports, you have airplanes, there's a lot of different places and I'm not trying to like scare you or cause you to panic or tell you to stay at home. I'm just, you know, being realistic here is that if you get a bed bug in your home, it's going to be very difficult to tell and pinpoint where it came from. Um, there's obviously like if you just travel, that's probably a good starting point, but um, bed bugs can come from a lot of different places. Um, and they live wherever people spend most of their time. So in homes, this could include beds, obviously. My family member spent most of the her time in her recliner. Um, and so that's where she found most of the bed bug infestation was in her recliner. Um, so then we have couches, chairs, and even wheelchairs and walkers. And um, there have also been cases where a person is putting on wigs every day and the bed bugs could be in the wigs because that encounters the person the most and also prosthetics as well. They like those tight, dark spaces. Um, and like I said, you can find them like behind baseboards, outlet covers, and in wall voids for very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Severe infestation cases too. So you're concerned you have bed bugs, what to look for? And this is actually the back of our bed bug ID cards. Um, so there's four primarily th primary things that you should be looking for if you're looking for bed bugs. You can look for the live bugs. That's obviously a dead giveaway. You can look for their cast exoskeleton because like all insects, they shed their exoskeleton as they grow. You can look for fecal and blood stains. Um, it looks like a Sharpie marker that's kind of been stippled and you'll find those um, kind of around the seams, a lot of times on linens. And then you can also look for those small white eggs as well. So here's a couple examples of some exoskeletons that we had found while we were doing our um, inspection. These are some examples of some bed bug fecal blood stains, one on a book, the other on the, um, I think that's the wood inside of a box spring. So you can see how it leaves that black stippling behind. Um, and these are, those arrows are pointing to some bed bug eggs. So these are kind of um, during the inspection, like the bed bug hotspots where a lot of them have congregated. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of eggs that are in the mix as well. So those are the four things, if you're looking for bed bugs, that you should rely on to confirm a bed bug infestation. So then the question comes, but I'm in bed, I know I'm being bitten, but I don't see any of those other things. So um, the truth of the matter is, we cannot diagnose bed bugs from the presence of bites alone. And um, so a lot of people will be like, but I have three bites in a line on my torso or on my arm because there's kind of this myth that bed bugs will bite in three or they'll bite in a line. And while that behavior is true of bed bugs, it's no, it's not, 100% of the time, some bed bugs will bite once. There are other things that will maybe probe and bite three in a line. So we cannot rely on the presence of bites alone. So once again, it's impossible to diagnose bed bugs from the presence of bites. There are many other things that can bite or cause bite-like yeah, bite reaction. You know, you could, um, there's lots of insects out there, especially this time of year, like maybe you were bitten out side and you come home and you just didn't notice it till you were in bed. Um, it could be even an allergic reaction has caused a bite-like reaction, um, something like that. <clears throat> and so if you, there's other tools you can utilize for, mo for monitoring other than just doing those visual inspections for those four things. Um, probably the most useful ones are going to be interceptor traps. So there's many different types of interceptor traps. There's pitfall traps, you can see here on the upper left picture. So it's like a shallow dish that if your bed has feet, you can put the feet of the bed in the middle. And so when a bed bug tries to climb up on the bed, it'll crawl into the, it'll fall into the dish and it will be unable to get out of that trap. So you can check, check that trap daily, you can check it weekly to see if bed bugs are trying to reach you on the bed. There's power strip monitors, there's sticky traps. I will say that um, sticky traps one, um, are not very successful at catching bed bugs. A lot of them will get out of the sticky trap. And with sticky traps, there's also a risk you're pretty much going to catch anything else, including your dog or cat that might step on it. And pitfall traps um, in research have been shown to be the most successful 
bed bug monitoring trap. And even if you don't have feet on your bed, you can even just stick one underneath the bed and see if you catch anything as well. There's also bed bug pheromone traps that are available at the store. Once again, those have had limited success as well. So try those pitfall traps. Those are going to be um, the most effective. There's mattress encasements, and Jody is going to go over mattress encasements a little bit later on, but it's pretty much this, um, like a pita pocket for a mattress where it covers the whole mattress and you zip it up with this really fine tooth zipper. Um, and so it covers the whole mattress. If there's any bed bugs that are left on the mattress, they will be unable to bite through or escape that mattress encasement. And because the mattress is white and it eliminates most of the seams from the mattress, um, it's a lot easier to spot bed bugs than it would be if you just use a regular sheet. And of course, um, there are bed bug sniffing dogs here in Nebraska. There is a company that has, I think, three bed bug sniffing dogs, and they're really good at their job. They're very specific for bed bugs and also um, bonus. They're pretty cute too. <clears throat> so if you did this inspection or if you find something in a pitfall trap, um, it's really important to collect that bug for verification. We stress this with any pest, inside or outside, always get it identified first. And bed bug identification, it can be challenging because they can be different sizes, shape, ages, and it could depend on the feeding status of the insect too. So um, on the left, you see that the bed bug is unfed and it's kind of this rusty orange color. On the right, that's a recently fed bed bug and it's more of that red blood color. But what you need to know is that um, bed bugs are insects. So they have the six legs, one pair of antennae. They're wingless and they're kind of this oval shape too. And their, their body is flat that you can kind of see here on the left picture. But even though I just described what a bed bug look like, there are a lot of um, other invertebrates that are commonly mistaken for bed bugs. So here in Nebraska, this is what Jody and I most um, often encounter with clients that are the imp bed bug imposters. There's bat bugs, there's carpet beetles are really common. I get carpet beetles in my house all the time. There's fleas and fleas bite as well. There's ticks. Um, you, there can be things like head lice or body lice. Um, and then there's also non-invertebrate things. So crumbs and scabs and really anything that can be found in a bed might get mistaken for a bed bug. And so this is where it's really important to get that um, identified because as I mentioned, bed bug treatment is not cheap. And so before you spend money on a treatment, trying to get rid of bed bugs, you might wanna double check that it's a bed bug first. And if you notice from looking at these pictures, you might think, wow, a bat bug looks really similar to a bed bug and they are really closely related. They're kind of cousins in the bug world. Um, so um, a bat bug and bed bug, they look really similar. And at least here, I can speak of in Nebraska, we do get quite a few bat bugs as well. And so you would think, okay, they look similar. How do I tell the difference? And this is where using a professional might come in handy because you need to look at them really close because you need to look at the hairs on their body. So bed bugs have hairs that are shorter than the width of their eye. And they're in kind of like these little neat rows, like fresh haircut. That's what I think of like when I think of bed bug, they have a fresh haircut. Whereas the bat bug, they have hairs longer than the width of the eye. And it's kind of like, I just rolled out of bed. I need a haircut. So you have to look at those hairs to tell the difference between the two. And um, if you're not a trained entomologist or not a trained pest professional, that could be really difficult. So that might be the situation where you would want to use an outside resource. Um, but also in addition to using outside resource, I really think it's important to um, understand the difference in behaviors of these two as well. So with bed bugs, humans is obviously the main host. And with bat bugs, as their name suggests, you know, bats are going to be their main host. So these bugs are going to be associated with um, bats either living in the proximity of a home. So maybe in the eaves outside a window or in the attic or a wall void. That's, um, so if you have bat bugs in your home, it's most likely that you have a bat situation as well. So you can see the bed bugs lined up on this bat wing. 
And so when we think about behavior, bed bugs most often are going to be hiding in a mattress, hiding in nearby furniture. Um, they're going to be causing a lot of bites to you. But if you find a bug that looks almost like a bed bug, but you found it on a windowsill in the middle of the day when it's light outside, I would maybe take a pause and be like, hmm, why would a bed bug be out here when its host isn't sleeping in the bed? And kind of like ask that situational question, like maybe I've only seen one or two and I did an inspection, but I only found these two by the windowsill or it was in the on top of my sheets and blankets in the, on, the, on the bed, but in the middle of the day and wasn't hiding. So those are the kind of behavioral questions we need to ask too when we think about identifying bat bugs versus bed bugs. And so why is it important to know the difference? Well, they obviously have different hosts. Bed bugs are going to require a lot of inspections and monitoring to see where those bed bug hotspots in the home are. Whereas bat bugs, you need to find the bats and you'll obviously find the bed or find the bat bugs. Um, managing bed bugs takes a lot of labor on the homeowner, the renter's part, because it involves washing linens, vacuuming, and doing all of that. And with bat bugs, it's as simple as removing the host, and then you'll know, most likely no longer have to deal with the bat bugs. Whereas bed bugs, it's going to take multiple pesticide treatments, they're going to be biting you a lot often, and it's kind of this whole snowball. So knowing the difference before you start with any management plan is really important. And this is a graph from my colleague Jody, who works out of the Douglas Sarpy office here in Nebraska. Um, and this was um, the percentage of bat bugs that were su suspected bed bugs that came into her office. And you can see, you know, it can be quite a few. And so it just reiterates that professional identification is really important and they're treated really differently. And with that, I am going to hand it over to my colleague, Jody. Jody, I don't know if you're talking, but I can't hear you. Yeah, no, I had to find my unmute. So what do you do if you find a bed bug? So we're thinking now that we've got these positively identified. Number one, and this is the number one rule in our house, my house all the time is do not panic because, oops. That was my bad. I'm trying to mute Jody, So I'm gonna take, um, <laughs> take control really quick. I apologize. Okay. Yeah, so the number one rule. So, you know, mom says don't panic. So you don't panic. And number two, you want to isolate the items that have bed bugs. You don't want to just like, you know, throw them up in the air, throw them out the window, run them down the hall. You just want to isolate them. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you also want to review reliable educational resources. And, you know, Kate mentioned we're here extension. We are, you know, throughout the U.S. We're in every state. And then in Nebraska, we're in every county. And then Kate and I, a lot of times we're the urban entomologists, but I mean, everybody has a as a home has the potential to get bed bugs. People get online, they start Googling things and they might not get the right answers. So, you know, put in UNL extension, put in a university website and try to find um, the resources that you need so that you can act appropriately. And then you want to proceed with a bed bug action plan. And you might be like, what's that? So I'm going to help you create one. You don't necessarily have to write it down, but you want to be able to go through the steps so that you can um, go through whatever you need to if you see a bed bug. And you know, it's important to have these things so that everyone has a standard response in your family or in you know the apartment or wherever you're living. It empowers people and it makes things go more efficiently. Let's see. Do I have control back? Oh, okay. So when people call me and they at, tell me that they found a, a bed bug or someone identify a bed bug, the entomologist asks, so what time of housing? So we'll go through that. And because this is bed bugs for homeowners and renters, um, uh, we will go through, kind of split it down the middle and you know do, do both, for examples. Anyone who'd be listening to this recording, so hopefully it will, um, it will encompass all situations. So we wanna know where you found it, 
how many did you find and how long have you had it? Has anyone been experiencing bites? And again, we know that some people don't react to bites. And also how many people sleep in the home? Because that is also really important. If there's only one person living there and they sleep in one bedroom and there's like 90 guest rooms, you know, the bed bugs are likely going to be where the one person sleeps all the time. Um, you know, did you recently travel or host any guests overnight? Or have you recently acquired any new slash used furniture items? That's also very important to know. So the action plan, as I said, it's going to be those reasonable responses, right? It ensures that we're going to have um, control over the situation or the best that we can. And as we mentioned, bed bugs don't discriminate. So we all need to have this plan. We hope that we don't have to use it, but it's there in case we need it. And so it's kind of like, you know, if you've got family or if you have kids, like what happens if you get separated? Who to call in case of emergency? You know, if what to do if you have a bug. So we're going to go through that for different situations. First, we'll talk about the multifamily housing. This is a place that has multiple units, multiple families living there. How to handle a specimen in any of those situations is to keep the buck. So because bed bugs feed on blood, we want to make sure we're not squishing that bed bug. If you've ever seen a bug and smashed it, if it's a bed bug, it may be filled with blood and that's kind of gross and it makes it harder to identify if it's all smashed up. So put that in a container, um, put it in a Ziploc bag. If you don't want to look at it, put it in the freezer. It will die. You can take that to your extension entomologist or your uh, pest control person. Um, then you want to report this to the landlord. So this is important. So if you're in, if you're a renter and you're a tenant, you need to contact the landlord. They may be the one who may be responsible for paying. They may do their own inspection. They may call a pest control company or have one in-house that will do the work or look for them. But they're the ones that are ultimately going to be responsible because they own or manage that property. You do want to document what you found. Write somewhere the date. Take some photos of what you saw. If you do come in or talk to um, one of us or an extension person, you know, have that in writing what we found, what we've identified that as. Um, as I mentioned, the landlord may pay for treatment or they may have in-house treatment. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what I know about uh, bed bug type laws in, in Nebraska, but um, who is contacted? We would love to say that other tenants are contacted because this is um, a, you know, a building wide issue, but rarely does that happen. If you are friends or know any of the neighbors, you are allowed to, I mean, you're able to communicate with them and find out um, if they have bed bugs. When it comes to uh, you know, multifamily housing, it does get very complicated. It's a very complex situation with a lot of moving parts, but you may get, um, guidelines on how to prepare for inspections or for treatments. If you are in living in a single family home, you know, you're still going to keep that bug. You're still going to have that identified, but you're going to report that to any of your family members who live or sleep there because that will affect them. And just because, you know, sometimes they do stay in one bedroom if that's where it was introduced. However, if there are people, you know, and if you have a big family or you have kids, you know, sleeping in your bed or each other's beds or moving blankets there and, you know, to different beds or sofas, it may be in different places. So you do want to let the people in your family know or anyone who sleeps there. You will also want to, uh, you know, write things down when it started, have some photos so you can talk to your, you know, pest control person if you decide to hire someone. But you as the homeowner or the person who owns, you know, the property, you're going to be responsible for um, hiring a company to do that or to do it yourself, whatever you decide. Um, you may want to contact people who have been over or frequent guests. That is up to you. Um, or if you have an idea of who that possible source may be to let them know, um, you would hope that if they knew about, uh, you know, having a bed bug issue at their own home that they would have let it, you know, but you know, sometimes we get questions about that. Um, and also if you do hire a pest control company, they will also be the ones to, um, you know, send guidelines on how to prepare um, to help you. 
So a lot of times, you know, we always, you know, people want to know about eradication. And a lot of times, you know, we wonder if this is even possible because bed bugs have been around for a long time. They were er eradicated almost for a little bit, you know, in the, the 60s and 70s. But, you know, due to some of these uh, reasons up on the, you know, the screen right now, this is um, those possible reasons why there's a resurgence and why they will likely never go away. Um, you know, today, uh, there are, it's very difficult and expensive to get rid of bed bugs. And if you live in multi unit housing and people don't work together, um, it's inadequate response, misapplications, they will, you know, continue to come back, especially if uh, we're bringing in secondhand furniture that may be infested if one, you know, tenant puts it outside and another one thinks it's great. And, you know, I admit it, I, most of my stuff was used in secondhand furniture when I was in college. So, um, you know, it, it happens. We all do things and hopefully with the awareness, you'll be able to inspect and be able to prevent this in the future. I am going to talk a little bit about the professional bed bug control methods because if you are hiring someone, you want to know what they're doing and what that actually means. Um, you know, sometimes people use the word fumigation to mean eradication or extermination, um, but it is a specific type of, of method. So these are the three. If you were to hire someone, um, they would do an insecticide treatment, a heat treatment, and sometimes, you know, depending on the situation, fumigation. So um, there's some, I'm going to do a little of each one. So, you know, the most, I would say the most popular or what people know about are the insecticide treatments. So this is a chemical treatment that chemi that a lot of companies will use. Um, it, it can vary in the type of products and the formulations, but you want a residual insecticide. So something that stays there so the bed bug can contact it later because they may not be active when you know your company is there treating. Um, there's also aerosols and dusts for voids. So you know places that the bed bugs will contact. And there's also contact insecticide. So a contact insecticide is it needs the bed bug needs to be um, it needs to be sprayed directly on the bed bug for it to work. And there are many of those. And if you even had a bed bug and you you know sprayed it with coffee or anything, it would probably die. But that's you would have to see the bed bug. Um, a lot, the issue with insecticide is number one, insecticide resistance. So over time from a lot of overuse of the same type of chemicals, bed bugs have been shown to have to be resistant. So the products that we've used in the amounts we've used is just not you know, effective that way. Also bed bug eggs are not susceptible to insecticide. So that is why it, it takes multiple um, treatment sometimes to really get rid of that population. The cost is based on the size of the room, the home, the place that is going to be treated, and also the condition of the area to be treated. When it comes to heat treatment, um, some people choose this because they don't want any chemicals. And I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just trying to say, you know, the, the, like the details of each one, but a heat treatment, it's not like just turning up your thermostat and cranking up your own heat. It really is about having um, like industrial heaters come in to, you can do it in a container, you can do it in the home, you can have, you know, a couple units out of apartment building, you could have a couple of rooms of a home, but you need to have it hot enough to have a lethal temperature. So the research has shown that temperature has to be 122 degrees Fahrenheit to kill all life stages. So eggs, nymphs, and adults. They also has to be appropriate airflow. So fans blowing that heat throughout the unit that's being treated. And also it needs to be monitored for those temperatures, right? We need to know um, by remote sensing that those temperatures are, are going to be lethal in all parts so that it can be an effective um, control strategy. This is usually done in a single visit, but it can be, take several hours, like six to 12 hours. And it, it, it ends when that target um, heat, 140 degrees, is has those readings. So then they know that all the bed bugs would be um, dead. The, the potentials for failures include when there's like cold sinks, right? So, you know, you think about your car, people always want to put things in a car. Um, yeah, it's not safe to be in a car in this heat. But if you're a tiny bed bug, you can probably crawl to a cold sink or somewhere 
um, a little bit insulated or um, protected to get away with it, especially um, when the temperatures are, raising, are rising very slowly. Um, fumigation is the last one that I'll talk about. This is not for all, um, for, for all situations. This is more common in the southern and coastal regions where they have uh, dry wood termites. If you've ever seen a tented home or container, it's releasing a toxic gas which penetrates through building materials, walls, cracks, and voids. It can kill everything that's living. So, um, you know, people, animals, bed bugs, all of those things. And so, um, you know, that's why it's good for termites because it penetrates through the walls where they're feeding. Um, this is also performed in a single day, but it is a long day and it's likely overnight. So, um, you know, the homeowner has to leave the home for at least a day. Um, and it's not possible for multifamily housing because you can't just do a unit. So, you know, in summary, here are all the comparisons of those professional treatments. You can see the costs are going to be different. Fumigation is going to be the most expensive. Um, and he can, you know, be a couple thousand dollars too. Um, based on uh, the rooms that need to be treated. And there's also prep preparation for that as well. You can't have anything in the house that's going to melt. But, um, you know, I'm not saying one is, is better than the other, but again, not for all situations. So, you know, why, why are some situations harder than others? Well, it depends on many things. But the two most important things is one, the population level. So, you know, how many bed bugs are actually there? Is it like onesies or twosies there, or are there, you know, hundreds of bed bugs? That's going to make a big difference on, you know, the the uh, you know the efficacy of the treatment. Also, clutter and clutter can just it could could be a hoarding situation, which would be high clutter. But it also could be like you know having too much furniture, having you know eight million books on the shelf, you know, things like that. So those situations are going to complicate things. And those situations need to be assessed before decisions are made about what type of um, treatment we're going to use, and how many times we need to come back and things like that. So it's very important also to know that, you know, bed bug management can cannot be successful without IPM or an integrated approach. So one method is not going to be the silver bullet. Right, you can't just heat treat your house and expect never to get bed bugs again. You can't just you know vacuum your house and think that that's going to be okay. So nothing is standalone because even after you get rid of bed bugs, it's there's you know who's to say how things can be reinfested or reintroduced. So a lot of times you know we're working with clients to try to find out how you know the home or um, got infested in the first place. Where did it come from? Because you want to make sure that you're not still introducing bed bugs. So, you know, bed bugs don't discriminate, but the families that have lower income that are not able to pay for these treatments are going to suffer more, they're going to suffer longer, and then it has the potential to spread, especially in multifamily housing. There are no financial resources for bed bug treatment. Insurance doesn't cover it. We get asked all the time if we have money. We don't have grants and we don't, we're not able to offer that to anybody. Um, a lot of pest control companies can't afford also to offer those services because it costs, you know, time, money, and energy for those treatments. Um, I have heard of some church or community organizations that may pitch in to help with the cost of some bed bug treatments for families or to help with preparation. And sometimes the preparation before treatment can be quite extensive when it comes to, you know, washing and, and drying things and cleaning up, especially if there is a lot of clutter. So, Bed, okay, so there are safe and less expensive treatment options. And so that's what I'm gonna go into now, but you just wanna also um, know that it's gonna take time, it's gonna take effort, and it's also gonna take monitoring practices. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but you have to, you, you have to be able to see that there is a difference being made. And so some of the, um, some of the practices we do um, include like decluttering and, you know, it's not that people that don't have clutter can't get bed bugs. It's just that it makes it easier to inspect a room, to treat a room. If you have less clutter, um, bed bugs will have less harborage to go to. So there's going to be, you know, less insecticide exposure to people because the treatment will be right where it needs to be, close to where bed bugs um, are living. And, um, you know, early detection is going to be key and also you know, in having the most effective treatment. And, you know, it will be the opposite. If you have more clutter, it may take multiple times that you'll have to treat 
Um, there's an increased risk of insecticide exposure to people and non-targets if there's continuous treatments, can be, you know, over time more costly, and it will take longer to see results. And I think that's another thing. Sometimes people expect it, that after a treatment, there's going to be no bed bugs, and they're not going to see them anymore. And it does take quite a while. It can be done, though. So some of the non-chemical but effective options include using a vacuum. Who would have thought, right? So, you know, get a vacuum. And what I like to talk about is the pantyhose method. It's like the only time I buy pantyhose, but you want to take, get some pantyhose, cut it off like at the ankle. And then, so you have that little toe, the toe part, you put that in the vacuum. You can put it like on the end of the vacuum here, you know, secure it with a rubber band, or you can put it in where the hose part is. And that way you can suck up bed bugs and exoskeletons and all those histamines and nasty stuff that are in like couch cushions or, you know, around the bed and the baseboards, and then it won't get into your vacuum. And then what you can do is you can take that pantyhose out, tie it in a knot, stick it in the freezer, or, you know, put a little insecticide dust in there and get rid of those bed bugs without infesting the vacuum. Also, you know, a hot clothes dryer is, is amazing. That dry heat is going to kill all types of, all types of bugs, but bed bugs, especially 30 minutes will do. And, um, you know, you can launder it in hot water too, but if you have to choose one, if you only have, you know, $1.25 to spend on, on something, dry the items before putting in a hamper or before anything else. Um, people ask about freezing. Freezing does work, um, and and a you know a regular refrigerator freezer will work, but it's um, it's got to be in that freezer for four days. So you know that's a lot longer than the thirty minutes for for dry heat. Um, steam treatment is also an option. However, it's not a closed steamer. This is like one of the commercial steamers that you would use um, specifically for bed bugs. The temperature needs to be one hundred and sixty to one hundred and eighty degrees Fahrenheit which means that's the surface of where you're treating, but you can see the bed bugs. So if you can see them and you can steam them, you know, that would work as well, but um, you'd have to have a digital thermometer to make sure that, that you're reaching that lethal temperature. And that means the temperature of the steam coming out of the equipment is going to be like 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, there's a risk of, of burn for the applicator. Um, other non-chemical options, um, there are for sale these heat chambers. Um, I know Kate and I each have one of these uh, zap bug ones. It can fit um, like bed sheets in it, it can fit luggage, bags. Some summer camps will have these and also uh, public schools or schools have these um, so that, uh, you know, uh, kids and students, they can have their bags um, heated up to ensure that bed bugs aren't being spread if, they, if they're found. Um, Kate talked about the interceptor traps or the pitfall traps. These are great monitoring tools, but they're also going to remove, um, you know, bed bugs from that situation. It's going to stop bed bugs from fighting and a lot of egg, um, you know, deposits. That's it's not going to be there too. So those can be used as a form of non-chemical option together with other things. Um, uh, we're a little bit the queen of resealable bags or Ziploc bags. It helps to see things, to remove things, to isolate things. Um, and also, you know, squishing using the cards, uh, you have an option of um, for requesting some bed bug cards. This is me one day when uh, someone released bed bugs uh, into our uh, courtyard and they were crawling all over and I just took the card anywhere one of those hard little cards can fit is is big enough of a gap. For a bed bug so you can you know squish them that way uh, and um, lint rollers sticky extra sticky lint rollers are great for um, some some types of non-chemical options as well um, there are some inexpensive chemical options and i have the prices here in case you know you're interested you can get these um, you know online in a lot of different places they're all going to be different so i've got a, a variety of them the thing is you always have to read and follow the label some of them are not going to be practical for your situation and others may be. So there is one stinky option. They call it the rag in a bag method. It's called Circle, and uh, RTU means ready to use. You take this spray, you spray it on any cheap rag and you put it in, in a, a plastic bag with all your stuff. And within 24 hours, um, you're you know, there, there's a really bad odor. That's what the company wanted me to set, tell you. But within 24 hours, all the life stages of the bed bugs will be dead. There is this option too, there's no pest strip and you see them all the time in hardware stores. It has to be in a enclosed bag. Um, 
this is what uh, the label says, 48 to 72 hours to kill nymphs in adults, but it doesn't say anything about eggs. And um, you know, there's been some research to show that it's gotta be in there for at least two weeks. So that might not be an option. There is a dust here called Cymexa. It's shown to be um, a really great desiccant when it comes to bed bugs. You just need to apply that properly. Um, it's, it's a silica gel. It uh, dries out on the bed bug. It acts like a sponge and removes all the moisture from that bug. These two products here are labeled for contact spray on mattresses. Sterifab is usually is alcohol based and um, um, yeah, you can spray that on the mattress and allow it to dry, but it will kill bed bugs. So these are some options. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about things that may or may not work and why they don't work. So there, there has been some studies about essential oils. These are plant-based. People love essential oils because it's natural. However, um, they researchers have found that, you know, this is not something you can put in a diffuser or put out in your room or put on your body to repel bed bugs. Research has shown that they may be repelled off of, uh, you know, luggage or bags, but in the presence of a human there, they will still, you know, risk going over the essential oils to get to that human. Um, there is one product here. It's called EcoVenger now. It used to be EcoRater. There is research to show that it has been um, effective on, on bed bugs. They do sell them in little containers for travel um, for, for bed bugs. Um, it does have a really fragrant um, like Christmas tree smell. Gave me a headache, but that is an option if someone does want essential oil. Diatomaceous earth is always talked about all the time. People love diatomaceous earth because you can get it in these four pound bags. It's, 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 you know, available and it's cheap and it's also a dust and it is a desiccant. So it is made out of little diatoms or, you know, little seashells that cut into the exoskeleton of bed bugs and then they die. However, because they come in such big bags, people apply them, uh, there's misapplication. So this is a misapplication. These are piles of dust. What the dust should look like is probably something more like this, a very thin layer. Um, and also if it's, you know, applied with around moisture, it's not going to be effective. And it is very harmful if it's inhaled. And so if it's applied improperly and inhaled, it will be harmful to human health. Again, um, there are diatomaceous earth that is food grade, but you don't want to breathe it in. It is less effective than silica gel when uh, tested in field studies. Okay, bug bombs. People love bug bombs or total release buggers. This is an aerosol insecticide. The active ingredient is a synthetic pyrethroid that bed bugs have been shown to be resistant to. So it's not going to affect them. Uh, it's cheap, but save that money. Use that for laundry if you need to. They are ineffective in controlling bed bugs and it can even make them scatter. As we learned, bed bugs love those tight harborages and places that this stuff is not going to reach. Um, so do not use this. It's, it's also, you know, uh, highly flammable and dangerous. So some of the insecticides that professionals will use are going to be listed here. These are pyrethroid resistant bed bug products. They are available. You can see on the right hand side that they are expensive in concentrate, but you also need the PPE and the equipment to use it. Um, so I'm not, you know, hiding anything, but I'm also saying like this is not going to be applicable for everybody. And you need to read and follow the label. If you apply it and it says, you know, everyone needs to leave the house um, until it's dry, that's that's what needs to be done. But these are the same products that um, you know professional pest management professionals will use when they come to your house. However, you know people want to know. Well, why when I do it myself, why do these treatments fail? And a lot of times, well, I would like to to relate it to you know having the equipment or having the products, but not really having the know how of how to do it. So for me, I would say it's probably baking because I'm terrible. So you've all seen that like, you know, nailed it show, you know, this may be what you're looking for, but this is what's going to happen. And you don't want that to be in a bed bug situation, right? Because it's going to take time to research those insecticides and get that equipment and pay for that and the effort to treat. 
But if you're only using one method, it's not going to be a successful treatment, right? You need to understand the bed bug. You need to follow the label. You need to understand what that insecticide is doing. And then in combination with all those non-chemical methods, it may be effective. But, you know, you, how would you know without monitoring? How would you know um, that things are getting better if you're not keeping track of it? So that documentation is also very important. If you decide to choose a company, and sometimes... This is the way to go because after you've done and tried everything and spent all the money on the things that don't work, it may have been more um, you know, economical to choose a company. As extension, we are not able to recommend a company because like, we have no idea. No one tells us if they're good or bad. It's usually anecdotal. But most times people will call and say, like, my company did this. Is that the right thing to do? Or, you know, I, I, I um, hired the first company that was available. So contact two or more companies. Find out what they're offering. Find out what they know. And after, uh, you know, attending this webinar, are they able to explain to you what you need to know? Are they communicating with you in the way that you you need them to ask about an inspection and those treatment options. Are they going to come out and look at your place before they quote you? Um, you know, things like that. And also the pricing. People don't like the prices. It is very expensive. But what are they offering there? What is their guarantee? Are they able to come back uh, if you see bed bugs in a certain amount of time, three months, a month, you know, things like that? Find out. Um, Find out what your responsibilities are before they come for an inspection. Do they want you to, you know, move things around before they come and inspect? Um, what do they want you to do to prepare? And is that feasible for you? Are you able to do that? Are the people or tenants physically able to do the prep for that? Um, you know, find out the number of services included in your visit. If there is an insecticide treatment, they should have at least two treatments because they should come back between two and three weeks because that's the enough time that the eggs that are, you know, not susceptible to insecticide will hatch. And so you would want them to come back. A lot of people don't know that, but that should be included in the service and it should be in that contract. And then this is your home. This is where you're sleeping. This is where your family is. If you don't have a good feeling about the, the people, the customer service, then do not hire them. Um, I, I should say that it's not recommended to discard mattresses. And oftentimes people do this in a panic when they find bed bugs and they think bed, bugs, bed, got to get rid of it. If you have bed bugs and they can hide in other places and you get rid of your mattress, you will infest the new mattress. So we do not recommend discarding the mattress unless you were going to anyway. But this is where that mattress encasement can come in handy. I do want to say that it is not like a, you know, this wonderful force field that will never let you get bed bugs ever again. But what it does, it helps you detect bed bugs quicker. It decreases so many harborage areas for bed bugs. So, you know, in, in these pictures, this is these are different mattresses or box springs. Um, and a bed bug mattress encasement, you know, that encompasses the mattress will be tested against bed bugs. They will not be able to crawl in or out or bite through it. It should have a smaller you know, zipper with the teeth and have like some kind of locking mechanism at the end of the zipper so that bed bugs can't live inside and come back out. You know, some of the negatives is that it could rip, you know, if you're not careful and but then it becomes, a, a, you know, a harborage. But and it's also very difficult to get on a bed. Um, but it is something that can help because look at all the seams and tufts and folds, look at the little, you know, plastic corner guards or the dust cover where bed bugs can harbor and all these little folds where you can find them. Um, I put down here the cost of them because they're not inexpensive, right? But it's one of those trade-offs. So if you only have so much money, what do you do? And probably, you know, if I was on a limited budget, encasements wouldn't be the first thing. I would get like some cheaper sheets that are white just to make it easier to spot those bed bugs. Um, and, you know, always keep in mind that bed bugs are not going to always be on the bed. Find out where the people are sleeping. Find out who spends time and what is being moved there. These are three different levels of infestation of a recliner because that's where um, the people are. So it's not just the beds. So this is what I tell everybody, like we can't control what's out there, but we can control what we bring home. So we just need to put that action plan, um, you know put it, put it in our mind and follow it. And it's going to be different for all of us. Oftentimes people always ask me what I do. 
I would probably say I'm at, at the extreme of what I do. And that's why my family kind of just like, here, you do your thing. You know, I get to a hotel, I put on my headlamp and my husband's like, just do your thing. And then when, you know, he travels a lot, when he comes home, he puts his things in the garage. Um, that's, it's our action plan. And that's what works for us. Um, I do do most of the, the work, but I, I don't care if I'm an entomologist. I don't have time or money or energy to put into getting rid of bed bugs at my home. But if you're going somewhere or visiting someone, if you don't need it, don't bring it in. You know, why bring in your whole bed and pillows and, and jackets if you don't need it? So leave it. Um, and then when you go inside, watch where you're putting things, put things on hard surfaces, put, you know, put your keys or purse on, on the, the table in there, hang it up if you can, don't put it on the ground, don't put it on a bed. Um, you know, I'm uh, also the queen of plastic totes. So it's something that's smooth um, and I have plastic totes and resealable bags. Uh, if I know that I've been somewhere that has bed bugs, you know, self-inspection before you get in your vehicle and definitely before you get into your own house. If you're driving someone around that has a bed bug infestation at home, you know, you put like a, a, a sheet or a seat cover over the, um, you know, the, the seats in your car so that if a bed bug does happen to, to come off or whatever, you, it, it's not going to get into the cracks in the car. And, you know, those totes in the back of the, the car like this. When I did carpool for school, all the kids' backpacks go in here in the back of my car, um, and then that's where they come out. That's just the way it is. Sticky lint roller, I always have in my car, um, you know, and and also duct tape. I know I sound probably like a, like I'm a, a serial killer or something, but I have these things in my car in case of ticks or bed bugs or anything like that. Um, it actually comes in quite handy. And then I do have a vacuum cleaner um, that is 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 used for furniture or the car. Um, and then again, my clothes dryer. So every situation is gonna be different. If you go to a hotel, a lot of times I'm gonna bring things that I can easily wash or put in a dryer when I get home. I do a quick inspection of the room, but you know, if I've been bitten three times in three different states, three different hotels. Yeah, I do an inspection, but I'm not gonna always see things. Um, so I focus my time when I get back from my vacation and I'll talk about that in the next slide, but I keep my luggage zipped up. I keep things, you know, in it, um, but I usually I'm under, like, I understand that I'm probably going to put everything that I can, you know, dry in the dryer when I get home. I think the most important thing is to, you know, not do this. And I think Kate <laughs> mentioned that I did that for this picture. Um, you know, I inspect the luggage holder that I put my luggage on it, pull it away from the wall, keep it zipped up. But if you have dirty laundry, which we all do, don't throw it on the ground or on the bed or on the couch um, and, and then pick it up later. You, when it's dirty, put it in like a Ziploc bag or a resealable bag and put that away so that bugs can't get into it. There was a study that showed that bed bugs are more likely to crawl into dirty laundry that's been worn by a human than clean laundry because they, I mean, we're their hosts. They're looking for us. So they're going to come to that. Um, and oftentimes when people do find a bed bug in a hotel room, it's because they're just sitting, you know, reading a book or checking something on their phone right before bed and the, the bugs will come out of the bed frame and that's when they'll find it. So I do a little bit of sitting before I go to bed. What do you do if you find a bed bug at a hotel room? You do your action plan. So keep that bug, but take a picture because if you take it to the front desk, they may or may not want to see it and they may or may not take it from you. So you want to do that and see if they can give you a new room. And if they cannot give you a new room, just stay at a different hotel. Um, best practices when returning home, isolate the items that you were, that you had with you, create space between where you're coming in and your bed. And so like if you've got a garage or a drop zone, keep your things there. Your soft items like clothes or you know bedding, all that stuff, pillows, um, go in a clothes dryer for a little bit before going in the hamper, inspect your luggage and your hard items like your toiletries, and you can put that back. But, you know, you want to inspect it, wipe it down um, if, if possible, and um, store your luggage or your bags away from sleeping areas. It's going to be harder to do when it comes to multifamily housing because you probably won't have a lot of um, room for storage, but try to keep your luggage not under your bed. 
Um, so some of the challenges of multi-unit housing, because there's high density housing, right? There's a lot of people in a small amount of space, and there's a lot of movement of people and items, furniture, and the bugs um, within the unit and between the units, right? So this really does require cooperation from the management company, the residents, and the pest management company. And so, um, you know, the problem with the stigma and the fear of disclosure can be difficult because a lot of times tenants don't want to tell their landlords that they have bed bugs because they think they're going to be kicked out. And landlords will not tell other, um, you know, the tenants that that their neighbor has um, has bed bugs, right? So, so that is going to be uh, a community-wide problem. And they've showed that when, um, you know, there's community-wide level of uh, monitoring and inspections that it has shown to help. It's just that it's very difficult and there are no laws that demand that at this time. So getting into the Nebraska landlord and tenant rights, um, unfortunately, it's kind of um, muddy. So, so I have to say these are the, the state, uh, what's in the state, but city and municipal housing codes may be different. So I urge you to do a little bit of research there if you are um, a tenant and you want to know what your rights are and what you're able to do, um, because it may be a little bit different than what the state, um, what the state shows. And in Nebraska, the landlord has to provide a habitable dwelling, whatever habitable means, and a tenant has to keep that unit safe and habitable. And so what happens is that the person who brought in the bed bugs is usually at fault and has to pay, but that is often something that is very, very difficult to prove, right? Landlords should have implied responsibility for taking care of the bed bug problem because they own the property and manage it. But you know, it not necessarily happens in all of the cases, right? And there is no law to um, prohibit landlords um, from renting out properties that are known to have bed bugs. So that makes it very difficult as well. So to wrap things up, dealing with bed bugs is not a one and done problem. It is something that, that needs constant management and monitoring. And I can guarantee after you have bed bugs and have taken care of it, it's something that you'll want to be, more, you'll be more alert to and want to prevent it because it is such a pain. Um, it takes time for an infest in, infestation to be recognized and treated. So it's going to take time to stop seeing them. You will see them alive and you will see them dead for a little bit of time because they do need to be alive and walk around and contact that insecticide. Um, bed bugs don't feed, like the same bed bugs not going to feed every single night. It's often going to feed every three to five days which is why in a hotel setting, it's perfect, right? One family checks out and you know, three to five days later, another family checks in. So that you know, gives that that perfect amount of time. So you know, it is gonna take time to get rid of your bed bug infestation. Um, and humans, we are, we are weird social creatures. We involve ourselves in all kind of complex social situations. You know, so-and-so went over here, they babysat here, they play with each other, they sleep over at each other's houses. This complicates um, bed bug elimination and spread. So we need to keep that in mind and we really need to be empathetic to the families that have bed bug issues and be able to help them without, um, you know, bringing them home to our own house. So with that, I would like to say thank you for, um, for listening. Back at you, Kate. Thanks, Jody. So um, I know we're a little over time, but really quick, I just wanted to share with you some extension resources. So if you're in Nebraska, um, every county has um, an extension educator or extension office. Jody and I are the only um, urban entomologists, but there are also um, a lot of educators that are well versed on bed bugs, like Elizabeth. But um, Jody and I, we offer identification services. So if you have a bug, you're not sure if it's bed bug, we can help you ID it as well as consultation services. So if you know you have bed bugs and you're kind of like, I have no idea what I'm doing, you're welcome to give us a call as well. Um, and then we have um, printed and digital multilingual educational resources too. So we have brochures on dealing with bed bugs and preventing bed bug infestation. And those ones in particular are um, translated um, in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. 
And if you visit this link, lancaster.unl.edu backslash bedbugs, you'll find all those resources um, and pretty much anything that you want to know about bedbugs, including most of the things covered in this presentation.